Um, before we begin, I just want to say I was remiss, and I, I really have to thank um, Molly Thompson and everyone at A18 Networks. They were the first ones who brought us this film and, uh, to yeah. show. And yeah, I. Thank you, on that note, I, I made a, a grievous omission. I forgot to thank Elaine and Rob, who are the head of A&E, really. And if we get any legal action from uh, Rupert Murdoch, it will be them who has to deal with it. So thank you very much, <laughs> Rob so and Elaine. They deserve Sorry a about big that. round of applause. Yeah, give them some money, too. To, um, you know, making this movie, figuring out what, you, what story you could tell, what you couldn't tell, how it all worked must have been... It, Titanic job, and if you could just, I just want to start there, if, you know, to see if you could talk about um, how long ago it started yeah. and all the legal stuff that was involved in the research. Um, well, I'll go to your first question about what, you know, uh, what you can tell and, and how you can tell it. I think it all depends really on your access, yes. um, because you, you hear so many things off the record. Uh, and it's not very many people who will come forward and actually talk openly. So that dictates, and I have to say that meeting Alison early on, you know, was a huge bit of good fortune for us. Mm -hmm. And um, she was one of the few people who was like, you know, this, you know, yeah, I'll talk about it. You know, I, you know, have a perspective on it and I can articulate it and I'm, you know, not, not uh, afraid of the consequences. Mm -hmm. So Alison was huge in mm -hmm. this and then helped me get to Glenn Beck. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's really kind of, I think the people who you meet who crack it open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, where did you find that footage of Mitch McConnell on the... <laughs> <laughs> Where's Felicia? Mm -hmm. Wow. There, Felicia Sugarman is there. Yeah. Um, you know, she's the one who told the story, like, uh, you know, reel in the fucking fish, Mitch. <laughs> so, you know, and then we looked. Um, I can't, <laughs> where's Gabby? Our archivist is here, Gabby. There, where did we find it? Oh, my God. Oklahoma wow. Political Center. There you go. <laughs> um, let's, I think that because of the... the the time, let's open it right up to the audience for questions. If anyone wants to jump into the fray, please raise your hand. Yeah, right there. Wait for the, oh. here you go. I don't think I need this microphone. But, um, it was a great film. First of all, how crazy he was and you know, objective he was. The idea that you started him from the very beginning and kind of showed what his, oh, okay. And showed like how he, you know, became who he was, um, was amazing. I thought that did a lot of justice to him as he was before, because I'm sure maybe he wasn't always this way, but maybe he was, and then he turned into this, you know, person that we then f later find out uh, who he was and unfortunately died under those circumstances, leaving, uh, Oh, the question is, <laughs> no, the question is, <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Um, the question is, in all of that, why, and it's such a stupid question, but. But you're going to ask it, though. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to. Why, why did he have so many crazy, great photographs of himself? <laughs> okay. I mean, being in the film business, it's like, okay, how, how did he have all those? Why did he have all those? They were like portraits by whom and why did he have so many? There, there, there are so many of him and there's loads that we didn't use that were even crazier. Um, because he's a, he's a, he was a big powerful man. I think, you know, I think when you, when you earn that much money, people like to profile you and they send... Uh, you know, they write articles about you and they send photographers. And then it's, you know, your job as a filmmaker to go and find all the articles and all the photos and then call up the photographer and go, you know, do you, did, you manage, did you happen to keep any that weren't used? And try and get the kind of series of them. Yeah. When did you get to the tap dancing as the structural? Uh, you know, as a um, well, the minute I heard he tap danced. Yeah, you, you know. had to do it. Yeah. 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 Yes. Here, here you go. Oh, 
I just want to know, Allison, thank you for coming forward. And Allison and I used to work together. I worked at Fox. And I'm just curious what made you decide to speak on the record? Because that's like the really hardest part, I think, to get people to speak on the record. Well, when I met Alexis and um, Alex, it just, I believed, and it's been proven to be true now that I see the movie, that they were going to do a multi-dimensional look at this very interesting person. You know, I wouldn't have done it if it was just going to be a hit job on Roger because Roger was a really interesting, influential person. And I think that he deserved an examination like this. And, you know, we all talked about that at the very beginning before I decided that I was going to actually participate. And I just said, you know, Roger was everything that you just saw, sort of charming and charismatic and vulnerable and paranoid and mean-spirited and bullish. He was the whole spectrum. And I wanted to be able to capture that, you know? Um, he was a big influence in my life. He was a huge influence on the country. And so I just, you know, it didn't take long. I mean, it took about a minute after meeting these guys to know that I was in good hands and that Roger's story would be in good hands and that they would look at the whole measure of the man. I mean, that's, that's a, yeah, but I mean, also to go back though, at that time, the Me Too movement was not out, uh, you know, was not out, was not uh, in full swing. And I do think that it wasn't an obvious, um, an, an obviously good, you know, wise decision. I mean. It was it, scary. <laughs> no, I agree with you. It was scary. I mean, just to be clear, it wasn't an easy decision. It was scary. As I said in there, Roger cast a long shadow. He still does. He still does, and Ro one of the things that Roger was good at was really scaring people. He scared a lot of us. He intimidated a lot of us. That was part of what kept you in line. That was part of what kept you working there, and that was part of what kept you from ever speaking out. But I was gone by then. I mean, I had left. It, obviously, it would have been impossible if I had still been there. But I had left, but I still had a lot of thoughts about my experience there and about Fox and about the impact that Roger has had on the world. And so I ap just appreciated that I found you guys and that we found each other and that you wanted to tell that story. Speaking of um, casting a long shadow, Allison, why don't you give your perspective on the long shadow that Roger cast on the Kavanaugh, uh, recent Kavanaugh testimony. I hear Roger all the time. I still hear Roger. I hear Roger in Donald Trump. And I don't mean I hear echoes of Roger. I mean I hear his actual words. Mm. I mean I can hear Roger's words and his influence in President Trump, and I heard them again in Brett Kavanaugh's testimony in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is so Roger, and it is so, you know, uh, Bill Shine, who was one of the senior vice presidents at Fox, now works at the White House. He's in the communications department. And they, they knew how to build a slogan. You know, Roger knew how to build a slogan. He taught Bill Shine and all of us how to do that. And when I heard Brett Kavanaugh say, I liked beer. I've always liked beer. I still like beer. I knew that he was channeling Roger. Roger would have told him to say that. I can't be sure that Bill Shine told him to say that, but I know that slogan and I know that syncopation. I know the pacing of how he said that. I don't think that Brett Kavanaugh came up with that. Who's coaching Lindsey yeah. Graham? That's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> Alexis, you were going to say something? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. We'll just, yeah. Somebody up, all the way in the back, right there. Yeah. Following on from Time's Up, Me Too, Brett Kavanaugh, Trump, the revelations in the Times, Rowan Farrow. Where are we going? Each of you, please, give me your opinion. Tell us what you think. <laughs> yeah. This is it right Alex, now. Alex, you're an expert on this. I'm not an expert on where we're going. Um, I, I do think within the context of um, what we're seeing in this country, and, and I think, we'll, you know, to Alexis's credit in terms of 
um, what she did when she made the film, is to see what happens when you combine robust entertainment values, which uh, certainly um, contain a, a, a sense of um, the importance of conflict and combat, and, and you set that loose like a virus, uh, we can go to a kind of a terrible place. It, you know, it's like the line in Gladiator, are we not entertained? You know, that's, that was kind of the, and yet at the heart of it is this sense, you know, behind the, the grease paint of the entertainment is this, is this sense of abuse that comes out of that combat that then spills over in a deeply human way. So um, we're beginning to see, you know, this country is a place that is obsessed with entertainment. We're addicted to entertainment. We're the entertainment culture country. And yet now that's affecting in a profound way our, uh, our politics and our civil discourse in a way that's terribly dangerous. And I, and I think that's why what Alexis has done is so important, to be able to um, shine a spotlight on that to warn us as to how far we could go uh, if we continue on the path. I mean, I, I don't know where we're going either. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's, very, it's very distressing. I think this kind of, this idea of this, um, you know, manufactured outrage has, um, you know, gotten results. So I don't see that going anywhere. I think, you know, on the other side, there's a lot of very genuine, you know, anger. And, you know, like you, uh, the protesters in the elevator with Senator Flake. Like, I, I wonder whether that's what it's going to come to, kind of, um, you know, sort of like a, like a gender war kind of thing. And, I, and I, I hope that's not what it is. But, you know, I think certainly, you know, people are, are, people on the left are being mobilized and are kind of furious. I mean, even people in the center, I, I, I think, are, f you know, feeling like, I don't know, it's, it's so tribal at the moment. But I, I see, you know, people participating more and more in, um, you know, civil society and government and more women running for office. And that gives me hope that, you know, somehow in this kind of, um, kind of bare knuckle fight, people who were otherwise not motivated to get involved will get motivated to be involved and will steer it back to some, you know, place of, of, of reason. You know, it, it is that sad old pendulum kind of thing. So, but I, I, who knows where it's going? But you can see this kind of um, uh, the kind of the weaponized kind of anger really has brought results. And Fox hasn't changed that. You know, when when Ailes was deposed and then when he died, it's not like they broke step. You know, they it it makes money. It serves a base. It serves an audience. So, you know, it continues. Well, I have a much more positive view of this. Um, I think that, I mean, if we're talking about the Me Too movement, I feel like we're in the middle of this cataclysm. I feel like some of the most gasp-worthy moments of the film that, Alex, uh, that Alexis produced was, were when you saw Charlie Rose and Matt Lauer and Bill O'Reilly and I mean, it just what what has happened in the past two years, just in my industry of journalism, has been breathtaking. And I feel like you know all of these taboos are being shattered. And now, because of everything that's happened, you know, with Roger Ailes, I mean, I think was sort of the beginning of the cascade. Now we can openly talk about sexual harassment. The floodgates have opened. People, women come forward all the time and tell their stories. And then now with Brett Kavanaugh, women are coming forward and telling their stories of having been sexually assaulted. And I just feel like anytime you can talk about it in public, you know, anytime you put sunlight on it, it by definition helps air it out. And so I'm not saying that you know, well, problem solved, and, and overnight there's going to be some sort of sea change, but I just feel like we are in the middle of this watershed moment, and I uh, think that it will lead to things being better. 
ultimately. It also had, kind of feels at the moment like it has the air of a last stand. I mean, all the effort that it takes to do, you know, in this kind of like, we're gonna plow through and get this guy in the Supreme Court. It's just, you know, um, because it's, the country's actually gone in a different direction. That's what all the desperation is about, right? Yeah. Here comes the mic. Did um, Roger Ailes ever try to stop you from making the film or anybody on his legal team? No. <laughs> That's amazing. Yep, right there. I, I will be haunted for the rest of my life with Roger's father pulling the bunk bed thing, which is a certain kind of a, a, approach to fathering and masculinity from other generations particularly. But what makes it so intense is that his son was a hemophiliac and he allowed him to drop to the floor. I will never ever forget that, but my question is this. This film is so rich that you only had so much time, but I wonder about other aspects of Roger's home, his upbringing, uh, the psychological implications or, or uh, the psychological situation of how he was brought up. Did you find out a lot more about his father's influence on him and how it was for him before he became an adult? Yes, there was, there was a lot more. Uh, you know, I have to say that that story with Jump, Roger Jump, um, uh, was we debunked it in the end. I know it took a hell of a long time before we did debunk it, so we, we let it uh, spool out as a story that he says to his son, Jump, Roger Jump, but then it turns out that that wasn't true. Um, his brother refuted it. Uh, you know, I spoke to his brother at length, and he said that's that's definitely not something that what my father would have done. Uh, I shared a room with with my brother. We had bunk beds. I was, you know, in the other bunk, and I would have known about it. But you know, um, I think that Roger grew up in an atmosphere of kind of sufficient, you know, cruelty that it became something in his mind that could have happened. You know, at an extreme. I mean, he said, "You you never know with Roger what was true and what was not." He he used to say that, um, you know, he went off to college, and his parents got divorced. You know, in his first year, and uh, he knew that his mother had moved away because his grandmother called him and said, "Your mother's gone." And then he went back, and all of his stuff was gone. That his father had moved house, and they'd gotten rid of all of his things without telling him. And uh, he used to ruefully say, God, I, I really missed my stuff. But I, I don't know whether that's true or not. You know, and the, both, both pe you know, the people who would fact check that, his mother and father are both dead. So I don't know. It is funny that you have a, a, a guy who, for whom, who runs a news network for whom it doesn't necessarily matter if it's true so long as you believe it's true. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be called. Oh, yeah. No, I just wanted to know that you that you that you turned up. I mean, kind of like Richard was also. I don't know, you know, Roger. That was surprising to me. And there's, you know, lots of Richard's interview that we didn't use. That was just, you know, so strange. You know, Are you in, it was though. But you telling, you know, when he had, Roger had his, um, you know, uh, cover story on the Hollywood Reporter, and that he sends it to you immediately. Like, why would he do that? You know, he was sort of, I think, almost obsessed with you as kind of like the kind of all-American 
you know, hero that, you know, shame, you, you don't really want to talk into the mic, sorry, they've given it to you now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, you know, he wanted to be someone like you, and, and as, you know, you're having this conversation with you on this granular level, and you, you know, we're, we're outside of the politics and the money of Fox, but it became very clear that Roger, you know, wanted to be something that he wasn't, I think. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree with that. He, he, uh, he wanted both sides of it. He wanted to be, you know, the upper, the blue blood, while at the same time he wanted to be a working guy. And he just seemed to never achieve either. So it's tragic in a way, but I, uh, I you know, thank you for the movie. It was just incredible. It was great to see the summary of everything. It was really amazing to get so many different perspectives on that. So thank you, Allison, and thank you to Will, too. You guys are the best. Actually, a woman had raised her hand earlier with um, yeah, uh, yeah, I know, but right there, yeah. Um, okay, it was the woman. Anyway, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi. I just, I wanted to say thank you so much for making such an enlightening, horrific film. But uh, what was the reaction of his wife and his son to this film? And did you ever manage to get any feedback from them? They haven't seen it, not to my knowledge. Um, but I mean, I didn't, I didn't know Beth. You, you knew Beth, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's her reaction generally to, you know, the allegations against him, and I mean, I don't know. What will she think of this film? Well, I don't know. I can't speak for her, but I think that the clip you chose here um, captured her perfectly. That's the Beth that I know where she was really enamored and awestruck by Roger. I was there when she gave maybe even that speech, but she, certainly when she gave speeches just like that about how Roger was a hero and how Roger had changed America and how there was no one more patriotic and how Roger was saving America. And she was all in. You know, she just, she adored Roger. Um, so, so, I don't know. I can't imagine what she'll, th I mean, I, you know. Yeah, don't, don't think she'll like it, the film. <laughs> um, there, we're also showing another film in this festival, American Dharma, about Steve Bannon, and I have to say that it strikes me that there's a real temperamental similarity between the two men. Um, not, you know, that Steve Bannon has been accused of of, of um, any of the things that, Roger, that brought Roger Ailes down, but does that strike any of you guys as accurate in a way? Well, I think so. I mean, I think that a lot of these guys are cut from the same cloth. I think that Donald Trump and Roger Ailes are very, very similar, and it's it, part of it is the feeling of being aggrieved, the feeling mm, that yeah. Even though you are a multimillionaire, even though you are at the top of the food chain, that you you're are the, the victim. Injured party. Yeah, yeah, you're the victim, yeah. and I think that it fuels them on some level. You know, you have to keep seeing yourself as the victim because that's the engine, you know, that powers you. So uh, I, I just think that maybe Steve Bannon is cut from that same cloth. I don't know him uh, personally. I don't know even his history as well, but I think it's that sense of, that we've always talked about of outrage and of being put upon and fighting for the little guy. It, that, that is what they think they're doing somehow. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Your hand is, there it is, yeah. Hello, so my question is, would you have the courage to make the same movie about Bill Clinton? Yeah, totally. Go on, Alex. <laughs> no, no, nothing. Go on, no, no, Alex. No, no, no. <laughs> no all good. <laughs> yes, watch this space. <laughs> no, not this space, watch. <laughs> space is near me. Mm. The, he's already making his own movie. You're seeing it every day. Yeah, it's a reality <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, it's in the papers, too. There were 14,000 words of it today. Um, maybe couple more questions. Yeah, yeah, right there. Oh, one, one sexer. Yes. 
I'm struck by a comment that Alex just made a little bit of ago uh, about um, sort of a virus unleashed and it made me think of zero days and the Stuxnet virus in a sense. I wonder if you see a similarity and what was striking about the Stuxnet when you, in your film, was it the unintended consequences? And I wonder if Roger could anticipate the consequences, if he could see in Lee Atwater the consequences of dividing, or if he was sort of surprised to the extent to which Roger had divided the country. Yeah, it's hard for me to speak for, for either of them, but I, I, I do think that um, one of the things that I think maybe was unanticipated was the, um, we, we tend to think about Roger Ailes, at least from a, uh, I tend to think, I made the mistake of thinking about Roger Ailes for some time in a purely political context. I think one of the interesting things about the doc is that you see him as somebody in, um, who grew up in part because he was a hemophiliac, spent a lot of time at home watching TV, thinking a lot about entertaining. Um, and that, and that I think is where he made common cause with Rupert Murdoch too. Rupert Murdoch, after all, championed The Simpsons for many years. You wouldn't call The Simpsons, you know, a, a vehicle for sort of right-wing politics. Um, but I think that the unintended consequence of a virus let loose uh, of, of an entertainment format that's all about combat and about um, engaging people who feel that they have been hurt or victimized and encouraging them to feed themselves on rage does have a larger um, diseased reverberation in the culture in a way that I think we're all feeling. It's not like it's new. You know, this, is, this has happened before. Father Coughlin did it way back when. Joe McCarthy did it in his own way. You know, it, it, it's been around. But, but, but the great entertainment values of, that Roger Ailes brought to that has had these kind of wild, unanticipated consequences that did spread, mutate, and migrate like a virus. I think it's a good metaphor. Uh, there's a gentleman here. This, uh, yeah, right there, right there, right there. Right. I think, Will, you've uh, taken a, a, a little bit of my, uh, my fuel out, but you're very articulate. And uh, I think you've identified the, uh, the backstory of this film. The, the, it's, it is fascinating to learn about Roger and his, his background and how he built Fox, Fox News. But what's the, the scariest part of this film for me and why I think it resonates for me and will continue to resonate for everyone that sees it is that the uh, backdrop is about telling untruths, lies, and the propaganda uh, aspect of his media empire or, or Fox News. And of course, the similarities between him and Trump are staggering. So I think uh, one of the great aspects, the great value that your film represents is, is that as a parable, almost, of where media is in this country and how dangerous it can be. So I commend you all. Well, I mean, I just, I just feel like I always have to remind people that Roger Ailes was not a journalist. He wasn't a journalist. And the idea that he started a news organization is a false premise. I mean, he just... Yes, I mean, that's, I guess, what he called it, but that wasn't his goal. His goal wasn't to find truth. His goal wasn't to be a journalist. His goal wasn't to be fact-based. He wanted to have a successful business. He wanted to be the chairman of it. He wanted to be able to have a say in the culture war. He wanted to be a kingmaker. He wanted power. He wanted all of that stuff. But f being a journalist and finding the facts those weren't his goals. Now, accidentally, journalists snuck in to Fox. I was one of them. There are still some 
you know, a handful of fine journalists there, and he needed their cover in order to say that he had a news organization. But I can tell you from meeting with him, you know, dozens of times, he was never interested, concerned about the facts. He was concerned about television. He was very, very concerned about television, but not about and journalism. And that's very different to where you work now, where they are very concerned about the facts. Of course. I mean, I mean yeah, the, the conversations that, are doing, it is Yeah, I mean, the way I'm at CNN don't... now and the way we vet stories, the way we have to be fact-based, all of the rules of journalism, we never had the, I never had those conversations with Roger, not once. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and thank you guys for being here. Thanks, Ken. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.